Hey everyone, it's Dan Ron from TheClinicalTrialsGuru.com. We're very blessed, extremely blessed to have Anna Marquez as our guest guru. And this video is going to be aimed at all the research clinics out there. Uh, it's going to give you some advice and excellent strategies and tips on how to run your clinic as a business. Anna specializes in this kind of stuff. In fact, she's a consultant, so if you ever need her help, she's going to tell you more about how to get in touch with her. Uh, but this is important because a lot of research clinics were forced to shut down recently. Um, a lot of research clinics are not necessarily doing well, and it's because they're often run by clinicians who, of course, are not business people by nature, um, or they're too busy to really uh, focus on that. So. Anna, welcome to the show. Welcome. Thank you, guys. Thank you for having me, and thank you for giving this topic the attention that it deserves. Uh, I think uh, most sites will find it helpful. And, um, you know, I'm happy to help anyone that needs it. So, thank you. Now, now Anna, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, for those who may not know who you are, I'll, I'll share a story. We met on LinkedIn, um, which I encourage everyone to be a part of. It's a group that I will not name because the moderator told me to not mention it. But it's an excellent group, so if you know how to find your way to it, um, you can join it. And Anna's uh, one of the top contributors there, the top commenter. Um, and that's actually how I got to know Anna. And she's got such tremendous uh, advice that she leaves. I mean, she will write like paragraphs, whereas other people will write a few sentences. And I said, my God, we got to have Anna on the show. Um, so that's how we met. And if you really want to know what group it is, email myself or Don or Anna, and we'll let you know. Um, so Anna, that's how we met. Yes, thank you, Dan. Um, well, uh, my background is in finance, uh, in terms of education, and uh, finance and accounting. Uh, about eight, nine years ago, I started working with a research site in Florida. And um, I've done pretty much anything and everything you can imagine, coordinating, uh, directing, accounting, uh, FDA audits, just really, you know, just everything. So I, I have a good understanding of the insides and, and outs of, of running a research site. But uh, a few years ago, I discovered that we were not invoicing for, uh, for example, startup uh, costs, pharmacy fees. And so I did an audit, and what I found is that we had left over $100,000 on the table in a one-year span. And I was shocked, uh, to say the least, you can imagine. And so I decided to put a systems in place to make sure that that never happened again. And so since I have practice management experience, I kind of copied the model from the practice. You know, you go to the doctor, you have a super bill, they, they mark off everything that's done to you and then you know you check out and uh, that gets passed on to the billing person and they get paid for it. So we should be doing the same thing. Um, I'm finding that many, many of the sites out there don't have any kind of systems in place. They can't afford somebody um, to do this, but I just don't think that we can afford not to take care of our account receivable. Um, Having just said that, I just came back from the Site Solution Summit this weekend, and I was really surprised to hear that only 57% of sites always bill the sponsors and CROs for um, the items and, and the visits uh, you know that we do at the site. Now, protocols are getting more complex. Uh, our revenues are dropping. Sites are going out of business. And so I think we need to pay attention to to, to this because otherwise you're not going to survive. So I think it's a very basic topic, but uh, an important one. Extremely important, almost never covered. Uh, you have to literally search the entire internet to find uh, even a paragraph like Anna would write on this group. Uh, so it's not stuff that's readily available to just look at and learn how to do. Uh, Don? Well, it, it also tells me that this whole field that we work in is still developing. You know, if you, if, if you work for another corporation in another industry, I, I worked in the, uh, for a uh, large corporate construction company at one time, and these things were standard. And yet in this field, I hear that 
what I'm hearing and what we've experienced here, this is not a standard thing, which was kind of different for us. Um, the other problem that I found that, that we ran into as well is that we try to put some um, some things in place where we can at least track what we're supposed to be getting billed. We had set up um, uh, something where we can correlate the visits. But you're right, we weren't really also incorporating the other little things like if you get paid extra if you get your contract in time, or if you had if you got like some unscheduled visit, you get paid for that. We didn't have that incorporated and things like that. And you really never think about that. And we were relying on the sponsor to actually to let us know that we're going to get paid. And then when you think about that, now I just talking to you, I'm thinking about that. That's insane. It is, and you know what? They know. They know we're leaving a lot of money on the table. And what concerned me is that I had a friend of mine that works for CRO, and he said to me, "You know, Anna, this is going to be the trend. We are going to move towards you having to invoice us for everything that you do." And I thought, "Oh my goodness! Uh, if we're not doing it," Now, uh, how are gonna how are we gonna you know continue to, to do business? I mean, I think we're privileged to work in this industry, um, but we're also running a business at the end of the day because if we don't collect the money uh, for our services, then how can we continue to take care of our patients mm -hmm. and offer the opportunities that you know no other industry can can offer? So I think Dan is right. I think because we are clinical people. You know, um, that we're at a disadvantage when it comes to, to the accounting part of it. Mm -hmm. And so um, what I did is I set up a form, and I track on that form for every protocol. As soon as I get a contract or a budget, I put on there every possible thing that you can bill for. I start out with startup fees, pharmacy fees, you know, all your invoiceable items. I have several columns. And um, I put down what the amount should be that we should bill, when it was billed, when we collected the money, um, what triggers certain payments. Because, for example, you know that some of the, the drug uh, fees don't get paid until, you, until the drug is shipped to your site. So I think it's important to also keep communicating with the coordinators, maybe having a meeting with them every couple of weeks and saying, has the drug come in yet? Has the drug come in yet? So that you know when you can bill for that stuff. Now, there's CTMS systems out there that allow you also to do that. They're, they still have, I think, uh, a ways to improve them. And I think, like, for example, uh, one of them was saying uh, today that they're going to look at, at making improvements, and so we'll be chatting with them about that. Mm -hmm. But uh, you can do it, you know, yourself, and, and especially if you're a small site, there are ways to, for you to do it uh, in Excel with QuickBooks. And so... You know, any way I can help, I'm happy to. So thank you for giving this topic so much uh, attention. Yeah, it's important, and we never discuss it with a guest. You know, we've talked about it before in separate blog posts. Um, now, what is the biggest cost that sites leave off the table? Is it transportation costs for the patients? Because I know in the psychiatric studies, that's you know most patients need transportation to the clinic. Um, so for us, that's the biggest cost by far because we have to pay the drivers 60 bucks each time they bring someone over. So those invoices add up. What What is the typical um, biggest, I guess, cost that sites well, the invoice for? Well, I think we're leaving behind, like you said, transportation costs, patient meals, I think also uh, are, are something, you know, big that we're leaving on the table. Um, and I think that there's many other things that we're not billing for that we could be billing for. You know, for example, uh, if you're storing records for, for 10, 15 years, don't forget to, to, to ask for that, you know. I mean, collect for that. You're not taking anything that, that, that you don't deserve, you know. Uh, we have to, we have the responsibility to store all these records for so many years. And so I think there's many, many startup costs, uh, closeout fees, for example, um, we're leaving on the table because some of the things you can't bill for until after the trial is closed out. Right. So I think we need to have an audit form, and then when a trial is closed out, have you received all that money? Remember that you might only have 30 days, 60 days, 90 days from the time that the study is closed out for you to bill that. To bill the trial. And, 
I think another huge problem that we're having is not reconciling the payments with our patient visits. And when I ask the sites, why are you not reconciling? Mm -hmm. I hear this. Well, I don't get the I don't get the explanations of payments. Well, you know what? That's very e easy. Pick up the phone, call the accounting department, and ask them to send you the explanation of payment for the last check you received. Don't assume that they're going to pay you for every patient for every visit because what I'm finding is they may leave out a patient altogether, or you might get paid for visit one, two, and maybe not visit three, four, and then you'll get paid for visit six or seven. So make sure you are collecting what is owed to you. You know, we try so hard to negotiate our, our budgets, but what good does it do if we're not collecting it, if we're not taking our time to invoice it? And why why are these payments not being received? Are these accounting errors on their part? or uh, You what? know, I think, you know, we're human. You know, we, we do make mistakes, but I think one of the things that I'm finding is that obviously if you don't enter your information into the EDC or there's a delay of some sort, you know, that may um, not trigger the payment. And so that's one of the things I've come across when I call the, the sponsor and I say, where's the check for visit four or five? And they tell me, well, you know what, maybe the data hasn't been entered or, or there's a question on the data. Mm. And so you haven't answered maybe the query. And so it's a good way for you to also see how things are working internally. Now that's a good topic. topic. If, yeah. let's say a coordinator forgets to enter a visit, and six months go by, the coordinator remembers and he enters it. Do the, will the site get paid for that visit? Even though it's they will. They oh. will. Obviously, as long as the, the, the study is open and you haven't exceeded the closeout date in the terms of the contract, uh, yeah, they will pay you. You know, So you have to look. Every contract is, is different. But yes, generally, they will pay, pay you. If you catch it in time, yeah. So... Okay. But um, I don't know. I'm, you know, I, I, I'm looking at some of the statistics, and um, this year versus last year, and this is coming from the Site Solution Summit. Thirty-two percent of the sites said that their debt worsened from last year. Um, those are significant numbers. Mm -hmm. um, then uh, fifty-seven percent, like I said, never bill. Some of them just do it sometimes. Some sites said that they never ever invoice for any anything. Hmm. So um, those are dismal numbers. Find it. Is there any way to tell whether the sites that are, this 57 percent that's not billing that those are smaller sites? Because I know you know I don't know because I think uh, you know we about 500 of us attend the conference, so I can't tell you how many sites did the survey. Um, I think it's a combination of small sites, big sites, but um, you know, when I talk to, to sm the smaller sites, I think the smaller sites have, have the, the larger problem. The majority of them can't afford a person to, to do this, and the majority of them don't. They don't invoice. So, you know, and if you use something like QuickBooks, you can have, you know, you can have somebody set it up for you, talk to your accountant, give me a call, I can set it up for you, you know what I mean? And uh, I like to send my invoices out every single day. The sponsors don't like it. But you know what? It's my site. And it's my responsibility. And otherwise, how do you know what's over 30 days? How do you know what's over 60? Mm -hmm. I think that the statistics are about 51 to 60% of your AR is over 90 days. Mm -hmm. I mean, a large chunk of money. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you know how you're performing financially? Now, Anna, I always had this question. Um, in the contracts, usually they mention that data must be entered within, you know, 48 hours or whatever, 72 hours. If you don't do that, are they legally not obligated to pay for those visits? You know, I don't, I don't know, Dan. I don't know the answer to that question. I'd have to look at a, at a contract and read it. But from my experience, they will pay you for it. Mm -hmm. So as long as it's done, you know, they want their data in, obviously, and I think, uh, 48 hours is, you know, is reasonable. At least that's what we strive for, two, three days max. But uh, what I find is that if you if you do it, if you do the work, and you know you bill for it, you will get paid. So. And we're gonna come back to the cash flow stuff here, but now let's talk about 
negotiating budget uh, for the first time ever. I was negotiating a budget and you know I asked for higher amounts, this and that, like I always do. And they came back to me with, I call it an excuse I've never heard before, which is the Sunshine Act. Um, it seems like they're hiding behind this. Can you tell us a little bit about what that is and is there any truth to the Sunshine Act um, affecting well, usage? Well, the Sunshine Act, the Sunshine Act will basically um, put out a list of how much we the sites or the principal investigators are collecting in revenues for the protocols that we're doing. Um, you know, it's just meant to have more transparency with the public. Um, you know, research is, I, I think it's a wonderful thing, but I think there's a lot of misconceptions out there, especially with the patients. So it's really all about transparency. I haven't come across that situation and you've come across, so I'm kind of surprised that they're hiding behind the Sunshine Act. Yeah. So, you know, um, that's really surprising to me. So we'll kind of have to talk off camera uh, to see how yeah. you can resolve that. That's this interesting. Person, yeah, she quoted me the act, and she said, I mean, I can't argue with that. I'm not a lawyer. So I said, well, then give us this much. And they said, okay. So it's pretty simple. But, um, yeah, that's the first time I've heard it. So I'm sure they're using it on other sites. And I was, I, we'll try to get to the bottom of this for sure. Yep. Well, you know, it's really funny because I think any of us that negotiate contracts could write a little book about the top five excuses that the sponsors and CROs use. You know, when we're negotiating these budgets, what do they say? Well, you're the only side asking for this. That's number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, they say, um, well, you're the highest one. Yeah. We're asking for the highest budget. And, you know, we all kind of just laugh when we're together. I think there must be a manual when they hire the contracting folks you know, I think they take this class and they all learn to, you know, these top five excuses. And I just, I just kind of laugh. But I think you have to be persistent, give up. Um, Mike J with RX Trials teaches a wonderful class regarding contracts and budgets. I highly recommend it. Um, but be persistent, okay? Anything you're going to ask for, they're going to tell you no. You need to keep coming back, but they want to hear why. Okay, why do you need that? Explain to them, listen, I need this amount, this amount of money for record storage because this is about what it costs me to, you know, store records. And so if you give them, you know, uh, a reasonable explanation, they, they'll pay you. So, but it, it's like buying a house, you know, you're negotiating back and forth, back and forth. Just be persistent and uh, you'll be successful. Persistence so. is key. Now... Another question that we're going to get into details here, uh, and there's probably no right or wrong answer, but when a sponsor initially sends a site a budget, how much room, because they, they're sending you that knowing that you're going to ask for more, right? I mean, of course, there's some sites that will say yes, because they don't know what they're doing, but when they send you that budget, it's expected that you're going to come back and ask for more. My yes. question is the margin that they're willing to play around with is it 20 percent 30 percent i've heard 50 percent um would it ever be a hundred percent what what have yes. you found out all of the above dan mm. and we have to be careful because obviously we don't want to get into any kind of price fixing discussions the percentages depend on the company that you're working for that you're working with for example if it's a small pharma company you're just getting started they don't have as much room as somebody say like Pfizer or um, you know one of the bigger pharmas. But I can tell you that there is definitely a good amount of room to negotiate. I've doubled budgets. Um, you know, I I mean the ranges are all over the place. But um, and I don't want to say you know I can't say well this should be your your number. Yeah. But uh, you know. Look at your expenses, you know, what is it really costing you to run that study? You know, for example, your startup costs. Uh, do a spreadsheet and, and look at how much time does it take your coordinator to put together those source documents? How much time is it, does it take to negotiate a budget? Is it 12 hours, 15 hours? Are you having to pay somebody to negotiate the budget? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I have a sheet like that. You know, how much time is your coordinator having to, to take away for 
going to the investment committee, um, regulatory, I mean, all of that, it, it's, I don't think we're being compensated for startup costs. We're, I don't think we're anywhere near the, our true costs. True, and I've got a good story, and I'll let Don um, follow up. We, you have to find out where in the study your site is being asked to participate. If you are a late add-on, and you know that they're having problems in rolling, you've got the upper hand. Have a more leverage, yeah. Yes, and here's an example. We won't mention the sponsors, right? But remember, Don, we were doing this study at one of our clinics. They offered this study at our other clinic but where Don is in charge. They sent him an extremely low budget, and I knew that they needed subjects really badly. So I saw that budget. I said, Don, send it back. Just tell them we want 50% increase. Mm -hmm. Right? And Don was like, whoa, that's a lot. I said, just do it. See what happens. And they turned around and said, okay. Right? Is that what happened? Well, yeah. you know what? The thing is that if you're on add-on site, you're right. They're having issues with the protocol. It's going to be harder to recruit patients. You have more bargaining power, in my opinion, um, because they're desperate. And they need you, and they need you right away. And time is money. You know, remember, the, the shorter that they can finish the study, the less expensive it is for the sponsor. Yes. So it behooves them to, to get that enrollment uh, goal, you know, closed out as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. More bargaining power with, uh, as an ad on site. Yeah, it felt really good. <laughs> good for you. Good for you. I think it's really wonderful. But you're right, you know, persistence is key. I think another thing that we need to um, improve ourselves on as sites is remember to ask for audit fees, mm. okay? Mm. If you have an audit, if you have an FDA audit, uh, if you have a sponsor audit, it's going to be very, very time consuming. It could be a week. I mean, your staff is going to be tied up. Um, ask for it. If you don't ask, they're not going to give it to you. But remember, usually they'll come back and they'll tell you no the first time. So be persistent. Explain to them, listen, it's going to take a week. It's going to take this many hours of to have to sit down with the auditor. Um, you know, I think if, if you don't have a for cause audit, it's reasonable that they reimburse you for that time. Mm -hmm. So those are things that we need to, uh, we need to look at. Now, this is when, you do, when you're asking for an audit fee, is this something you're asking at the time that you're initiating the contract or you're waiting until the audit actually... No, I do it. I do it when I'm negotiating the contract. And uh, also remember to look at your SAE fees, IND report fees, um, protocol amendment fees. You know, protocol amendments are increasing. I think right now it's uh, an average of 3.6 uh, amendments for protocol. So, I mean, when, a, when a, a protocol is amended, you have to have a team meeting, documents have to be signed off, you know, maybe you have to reconsent patients. So, you know, ask for all that. Reconsent fees. It, it, that's, that's a standard item as far as I'm concerned, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so there's, there's uh, a lot of room for us to improve, I think, financially. We've got to get savvier because it's going to get tougher for us. So I think that's the key. Now, when you say get tougher, I, I kind of get what you're saying, but can you explain what you mean by that? Well, I think that the market is, is getting more competitive. More sites are entering the market, um, so that's an issue. Then by having new sites enter the market and by having individuals negotiating budgets that may not know what they're doing, that's driving our price down. It's driving the fair market value down. So the naive sites impact us. So I think it's important to know what we're worth and you know, tell the sponsor and the CRO, and I tell them, I don't compare myself to anybody else. I know what I'm doing. I know what my staff is worth. I have quality control processes in place, and you know what? All of that takes money, and better data is what you want. So, um, and the protocols are getting tougher. Uh, we've got the issue where all these patents are about to expire, and so it's just, you know, so much change going on in the industry, uh, more regulations, more paperwork. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing the, the sponsors beginning to give more of the work off to the CROs. So we've got to keep up with everything going around us, I think, if we're to survive. I think only the savviest sites 
and sites that uh, establish good alliances will remain in, in business. So. I agree. Uh, now with the CROs, you, you mentioned that there's more consolidation going on. Um, when they get a bid from a drug company, um, well, I, I should rephrase my question. Who who has the most generous the most generous budgets for the sites? Is it the sponsors or is it through a CRO? Well, you know, I really don't know the answer to that question, Dan. I think that I think that the sponsors, you know, give them uh, they, they give them a fee, and I think that the that the CROs, you know, might have a little bit more bargaining uh, power now. Obviously, if uh, if you're exceeding the norm, then they do have to go back to the sponsor and ask for permission. I mean, ultimately, it's the sponsor study, so uh, they've got the final say so on everything. So I think that the CROs have a range uh, where they can negotiate with you, but if you go beyond that range, then it's up to the sponsor. Mm -hmm. It's almost like managed care. Yes, exactly, exactly. So, um, yeah, I think that's a that's a good good question. I wish I had a better answer for you. And what what is with the preferred sites that the CROs have? Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Or now they're calling them partner sites. Yeah, what is that? Well, you know, I think that the CROs and the sponsors are trying to identify top performing sites because only about 30% of the sites bring in, uh, I think it's over 70% of the subjects. So there again, it, it goes back to the idea of building alliances with sites who, who've got proven techniques. Uh, they've proven, proven themselves in terms of enrollment numbers. Uh, they've probably got good staff. I mean, they come in and they do an assessment of your site at every level. Um, they look at the experience of the staff, the experience of the PI. But don't think that just because you're a preferred site, that doesn't mean that you know, you're automatically going to be awarded every study. That's not the case. It just may mean that you might find out about it before uh, the rest of the sites. But that's not, that's not the golden ticket to success either. So right. be aware. Hmm. Yeah, we've noticed that because we're not a preferred site. And uh, we, you know, sometimes we're an add-on site, things like that. Um, Don, you had a question uh, related to receiving payments, right? Now I gotta go back because there's been so much information. I've been what does a judged. site do? What do you tell a site when a sponsor is slow at issuing payments? What? What? When the the sponsor, site do? I'm sorry, Dan. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, let's say a sponsor is uh, notoriously slow for sending payments. I mean, what? How much power does a site really have? Well. Here's what I say. When you, I, I think that we are in the best position when we're negotiating the contract mm -hmm. and the budget. Um, I think maybe you, you should think about putting some sort of clause in the contract that states, you know what, if I don't receive payment within this many days from the, from the date it's due, then your monitor won't be able to come in here anymore. Wow. Uh, or, you know, we're going to, you know, I mean, there's, there's different things that you can do in terms of the data. So, but have it in the contract. Uh, tell them up front. And that's, uh, that's really big for them. They want their data. I had somebody that called me earlier this year. And he said to me, you know, he said, I've got this sponsor that owes me over $200,000 and it's nine months overdue. Wow. And I said, you know, consider calling the sponsor and saying, you know what, your monitor is not welcome back until you've got that check in hand. And, you know, I don't know if that's right or wrong, but I can tell you that two days later that man was paid. <laughs> and he was later. quite happy. <laughs> wow. There's another problem I see with some of the process because we're, we're talking about one company in uh, specifics. And one of the things that I see is they have the project managers and whoever the liaison is for the project managers working on behalf of the sites to handle all the, the accounting and invoicing. And they're your spokesperson for accounting. And I know working uh, with accounting at other companies, they're, they're two different animals, completely two different animals. Yes, and that, they are. And, and for me, I, I, I think the problem is that 
forget in this case we've got these people on this side who have set up the study who are running the study supposedly fighting our battle to get our invoices taken care of and and what I feel is that they're really not interested in doing that they're only interested in getting this study done and completed right and, and they really don't want to get into the money matters and then the people that are on the accounting side they have their way of doing things and they're not at lo really looking at adhering to what the project manager and these people want done and, and I think that's and, I, and not just with this company but I'm seeing this with other other sponsors too and I think that's just that's a major problem. It's and a major it's, problem. And you know, you're right, and that's actually something that I brought brought up last year at the Site Solution Summit. There seems to be a disconnect between the clinical team and the contracting department, and the contracting department doesn't always have a good understanding, and I don't think it's their fault. You know, I think we have to educate them. Um, I don't think they always understand, for example, how time-consuming an SAE can be. Um, but what I find with regard to the project managers, if I'm having an issue getting paid, first obviously I call the accounting department, but if I'm not getting anywhere, I'll go to the project manager. And I've never had an instance where they weren't helpful. They were glad to, you know, call the accounting department and get the issue resolved because, you know, they want their trial to proceed successfully, you know. I mean, they're responsible. They want to look good. And I think also if they appreciate you as a site, they want to keep you happy. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, don't be afraid to knock on whatever, whoever's door you've got to, you know, I mean, uh, as much as we love what we do, we have to get paid for what we do, so, Absolutely. yeah. You know, and I think the other thing, too, is that we have to focus on, too, because another issue that I saw in this whole thing going on is that we were asking the project manager to follow up on whether or not they've cut a check for this, you know, particular um, a service and I realized that we have to get extremely specific we have to talk about what particular invoice when what dates on that invoice and that type of stuff because I think what, what was happening is that the project manager was just calling up and says did you guys send this site a check and they sent us checks for the visit but there were other services they owe which was actually um, the amount that were a lot higher than the actual visits amount. And uh, they'll say, yes, we sent them a check. <laughs> yeah, okay, it's resolved. Yep. You know. Well, and I mean, all of that is, is in the contract. But, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking, Dan, retroactively to one of your questions about what, what are we leaving on the table. And one thing that just came to mind is advertising fees. Ah, okay. That's something else we're leaving. Sometimes we'll we'll get an allowance, five thousand, six thousand, whatever it is for advertising. We'll do, we'll do the ad, but then the person who handled that fails to maybe go to the accounting person within the site and say, "Hey, you have to bill for this." Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of money also that we're leaving. Oh, yeah. So and then another thing with the payments is you know the the CTAs, the language on the CTAs. It, it's getting savvier and savvier every by the minute I think and, and not to our benefit okay so I think we have to be careful looking at things that say uh, hey if you've got uh, a deviation uh, you know that might give them reason not to pay us we need to be looking at the indemnification clause as well um, you know for example I was I was on the phone a couple of hours ago with a sponsor uh, with regard to the indemnification and it basically said if you deviate in any way from the protocol that's it they're not responsible for anything that might happen to that patient even if it's drug related and so you have to allow so for some minor deviations because every protocol has something and you can't control everything say you have a patient scheduled to come back on Thursday and maybe the patient has a an emergency a relative gets sick he goes out of the state or you have a patient that uh, Maybe he's using the restroom and you're one minute out of window. You can't control those things. Mm -hmm. So we have to protect ourselves. You know, remember to put something in there to, uh, you know, to, to carve out those exceptions. That's, I definitely agree with that. Um, and the advertising, there's different things you can do with that, right? It's not just uh, TV or radio or newspaper. 
right? No, I mean, you can really do, I mean, you can do really pretty much anything. And there's some really wonderful um, companies out there like Clinical Connection, mm -hmm. Center Watch, um, you know, obviously TV advertising is very, very successful. I know in the past for me that's worked very well. Um, LinkedIn, you know, networking with people is wonderful. Facebook ads also works great for me. Um, but we are forgetting to go back and, and ask for this money. And don't forget that if you've already used up your advertising dollars and you need more and, and you're doing well, you can go back. They'll give you more money. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think there's a lot of things that we can do. We just have to be very savvy and we have to understand our business and we have to uh, network with other sites and see how they do, you know, their processes. I, I find that no matter how well versed you are, you learn something from everyone. And um, that's why I think the Site Solution Summit is so valuable. Not only do we go over the industry statistics and and um, what's going on, but we meet a lot of great people. So it's nice to see how different people resolve different issues. It's very creative. I've heard about that. We've got to get involved. Uh, now, Anna, you were mentioning that protocols are getting more complex, which is true. I've, I've been doing this since 2005. Well, earlier, but full-time from 2005. And I've noticed, you know, protocols are getting much more complex. They're demanding much more. But the budgets are getting much smaller yes. uh, at the same time. Now, is the recession to blame? Is the fact that so many competitors exist? Um, and I thought most of these um, sites that don't know what they're doing have already shut down, right? But uh, apparently the budgets are still the same. Yes, well, or, or worse, Dan. In some cases, the budgets are dropping. And I think it's a combination of the two things. Mm. The economy has been hard on everyone. Um, I mean, that, that's, that's clear to all of us. But I also think that, that more sites entering the market, it, it's impacting our numbers. The naive sites are, are definitely skewing the data, which is why we have to know, you know um, what we're worth. And then I think that sponsors, in terms of negotiations, they look at your past metrics you know what have you what have you requested for in the past maybe for an SAE or an unscheduled visit or a coordinator a coordinator fee mm -hmm. um, that's the biggest number I think that that impacts your current negotiations so um, and I think another thing that we're we're kind of all over the place I wish we'd get our act together is overhead rate mm. in, in Overhead rate. I was I was reading a, a report recently, a few months ago. I think it was by Ken Getz. Um, and I mean the overhead percentages. I think they've ranged anywhere from like fifteen to seventy something percent, and it's it's just crazy. And what I do is I look at my profit and loss for last year. I look at my overhead, and that's what I use. So, um, and then talking about the naive sites and how they impact us. I, I deal with some of those sites and, and what they tell me is, well, Anna, um, I don't want to negotiate the budget. I just take whatever I can get because I don't want to upset the sponsor. Mm. I want to be left. I want them to come back to me. You know what? You not negotiating the budget is not gonna is not gonna put you in a better position than somebody else. Okay? That's that's just not the way it works. I think we're giving them a, a bit too much credit. Um, so you know, I think we need to we need to look at our numbers carefully. We need to be better at what we're doing in terms of the finances and the accounting. And if you can't do it, we all have an account. I mean, because your corporate taxes have to get done. Um, call me, send me an email, you know, and I'll help you. So, yeah, there's a lot of resources in, in our industry. And thanks to people like you guys that, you know, are putting this out there. I mean, it, it's giving everybody an opportunity to learn more and you know, tap into resources that they might not know that they had. So yeah, people should learn more. I think if I was a sponsor and I was sending someone a budget for a at a site, it would almost be a red flag if they don't try to negotiate. I would think, well, these guys have no idea what they're doing. Why, you know, it's almost would work against you. Yeah, it's it's just them not knowing. Hmm. Or some some of them say to me, well, you know, I I talked to people in the industry and they told me that. All I should shoot for is 
you know, five or ten percent over what was proposed to me. Right. And um, it, it's it's just lack of knowledge, I think, you know. But uh, again, there's people out there that teach the course, like Mike J. I think he's amazing. And um, you know, there's just no reason. I think that not educating yourself in terms of, of the negotiation process, it's costing your site tens of thousands of dollars and possibly more depending on the number of protocols that you do. You know, and hopefully you're a site that's going to that's gonna grow, but you want to do things right from the beginning. It, I just think it makes things easier and I think it increases your chances of, of succeeding. So... Yeah, I agree, Anna. Uh, this is priceless information. Now, if someone would want to get a hold of you, uh, let's say they need some help, um, are you available for that? Absolutely. Um, I can. First of all, you can go to my website. It's at www.clinicalsitecommerce.com. Uh, you can also call me. My number is three five two two six six. Two six two five, um, or you can also shoot me an email. Uh, a as an apple, T as in Tom, M as in Mary, at clinicalsitepartners.com. And Dan, you've also got my information, so you can also uh, get in contact with Dan, and and he'll forward your information to me. Yeah, I'm going to so, post it. Post it. Um, so you can do the site budget negotiation, FDA audit, site processes, business development, clinical site infrastructure, basically everything that a site would need uh, <laughs> from a yes. business standpoint. Yes, absolutely. Because you know what, Dan? What I want to see, uh, I want to see the sites that are really committed, the sites that uh, want to do good work. I want to see those sites succeed, you know? Um, some sites need to be weeded out, but I think that chances are if, if somebody's watching this, it's because they care. And I, I, I haven't met uh, many sites who don't want to be better at what they do. And uh, I think you need to do everything in your power to, to make sure that you stay in business. We have a responsibility to our employees, to our patients, to our investigators, and it is a privilege to work in this industry. So thank you. And I pull up the website on on my phone. I don't know if you can see it. She has a blog. Anna's got a blog, uh, which I love. Uh, I think is very important. And you your recent post is good site, bad site, or work in progress. What? Uh, tell us a, a little bit about that. Okay. Well, I think we all think we're great. Yeah. We all want to think we're the best at what we do. But you know what? Let's be realistic. From the sponsor's point of view, from the CRO's point of view, you might not be a good site. And I think that um, you are only as good as your coordinators. So we, we need to give them better credit. We need to educate them very well. There's a lot of people out there that will take a receptionist, anybody off the street, and slap the title coordinator on them. Mm -hmm. And you know what? If they fail to do a good job, you'll, you're, you're never going to hear from that sponsor again. And it's amazing to me how many sites I say to them, well, have you worked with this sponsor? Do you work with this sponsor? Well, yeah, I used to, but I haven't heard from them in two years. Mm -hmm. I'm just amazed that they don't pick up the phone and say, why? Mm -hmm. Why are you not happy with my site? And you know right. what? They'll tell you what you did wrong. So what I like to do with every monitor visit, I like to sit down. I like to, I have a form that I created and I tell the monitors, how's my staff performing? Uh, what's our average with queries? What did you find? Do we have any issues with informed consents? Uh, I think you have to stay on top of that because we, we want to succeed, but how can we succeed if we don't have the right people? Mm -hmm. And it's very, very hard to find good people. And so I think it's our responsibility to train them properly. And that is an issue that we have with sites, um, not giving the staff the proper training, the follow-up, uh, the backup that they need, because we're all so busy. You know, we're, we're wearing 10 different hats at all given times. So, um, you know, and then, and then you think about the business development. Well, I think the business development, it's wonderful. We have to do business development, but 
what good is it for me to be out there promoting my site if my staff doesn't know what they're doing and maybe the sponsor is not happy with the work they're doing, you know? So it, I think it, it all, everything links together. You know, you have to have a good budget. You you want to have good people. You And, and I mean, in call me and I can tell you, you know, I have presentations that I do for sites. I think it's important to, to have regular staff meetings with them and you can even uh, assign different staff members. Listen, uh, educate, let's go over GCP, you know, E6 uh, in a couple of weeks, do a presentation. Sometimes I ask them, what do you want to learn about? I do the research on the topic, I do a presentation. Uh, I even, you know, uh, we even have a little question session, answering and question, whoever gets it right gets a little something. You know, make it fun for them, but um, yeah, I think there's a lot that we can do. And, and also, don't be afraid to tell the sponsors, your monitors, what you're doing. You know, how are you maintaining your, your quality control? Are you auditing your studies? If you've had issues in the past, um, there's a, you can always improve. And repairing a relationship with a sponsor is not easy, but it can be done. But you have to keep your monitor informed of the improvements that you're making and the new processes that you might be putting in place. So that's sort of what that article is about. You know, are we a good side? Are we a bad side? There are bad sides out there. Uh, I think we're all a work in progress at the end of the day. So. Yes, no, I, I, got a great, I have a great story that I will, I, it's actually a question, but I, I will ask I, it. I have a question too. Have you ever gathered a bunch of sites together and maybe done a conference call where you're doing training? I'm sorry, can you say that again? Have you ever gathered a bunch of sites and maybe done a conference call or a webinar where you're doing training? No, but you know what I'm thinking, what I was thinking of is uh, reaching out to the sites and finding out if they want to maybe get together and uh, have a discussion on, on, on practical, you know, get into the nitty grit, gritty of, of how they can do this, how they can set up their AR. And I think there might be a need for it. I think, uh, I think there's a shortage in our industry for that. For example, I was just talking to Dr. Kay Trait, um, who I work with very closely, and she was saying to me, you know what, Anna? She says, I've been to, to QA seminars. She says, but I haven't seen a seminar yet where they actually tell you step by step what you need to do to, you know, maybe audit your, your studies. And so her and I are actually getting together in about three weeks and we're going to be auditing one of the trials and I think we're going to be getting together with a couple of other sites mm. to develop a program that we can, you know, share with other sites out there. That would be great. So, yeah, networking is, is fantastic. But you have to find the people that that want to do it, that want to be better, and that are willing to also put put in a little time, or or if you don't have time, at least give us your input. Right. You know, give me a call and tell me what you think, what you think there's a need for, and if I can't if I can't help you, I'll be happy to send you to the right person. So. Now I have two two things before we wrap up. As we wrap up, um, one is related to business development, and it's related to bad sites. There is a bad site. They're a small site. Um, they worked with a sponsor on a study that we did, and I know who they are. And they did horrible. I mean, they probably screened 20 patients, only randomized one. Everyone else was screen failure. I thought to myself, this person's never going to get the next study from this sponsor. And lo and behold, they did. Uh, is the sponsor just not knowing what they're doing or do you get a second chance or what what could be the reason for that well I think there's different things in play for example was it maybe a protocol that was very very difficult to recruit for maybe it was a rare condition and so you know they understand that like I'm thinking right now of a, of a particular sponsor that's having issues recruiting for for a study mm. and at the Site Solution Summit, one of my friends said to the sponsor, listen, I feel horrible because this is my first study with you and I'm not performing well. And I said to her, well, I happen to know the protocol because we're also doing it. I said, nobody's performing well in that protocol. Mm -hmm. And the sponsor said to her, you know what? It's okay. We know it's a tough protocol. Don't worry. You'll have another chance to work with us. But also, I was, uh, I was in a 
seminar or workshop that uh, Adam Chassie did over the weekend. Adam is wonderful, by the way. Uh, you know, he used to work with quintiles, and he's with RX Trials now. Okay. And he was saying that, um, you know, sometimes it's, it, it can be first come, first serve, and I had heard this before. I had heard this from a CRO who said to me, you know what, Anna, getting your feasibility survey in quickly is crucial. Um, because sometimes, you know, we, 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 we get very complicated. The feasibility surveys, they seem to ask you everything and anything, even the budget. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I don't think it's as complicated as we think in terms of selecting the sites. Clearly, sometimes they look at your metrics and they may look at your previous performance and, you know, were they happy with your site. The monitors have the opportunity to recommend you. But, uh, yeah, I think sometimes it's uh, pick and choose. You know, I think it's, uh, I These don't know. These feasibilities are humorous. Uh, some of the questions are just ridiculous. They get into, okay, I understand where your patients will come from. Will they come from your PI? Will they come from a nursing home? Will they come from referrals? Will they fall out of the sky? They ask you all these things. I mean, literally, right? Yeah. They ask you, you know, are these, how many pa how many of your patients from your database will fall out of the sky and hit you on the head? How, how many patients in your database <laughs> is on this kind of medication? How many are on this type of medication with the same indicated uh, disease? And it, and it really does. It, none of it really makes any sense. It just shows that there's a disconnect between. I guess where they are at an academic level and where we are, you know, at a practical level. Back yeah, absolutely. Industry. And I think it'd be wonderful if, if you can get somebody from the CRO or sponsor side to answer those questions because I don't know of any side out there that doesn't scratch their head and say, <laughs> where is that coming from? How can I possibly know? Right. And I've seen sponsors that will say to you, you know what, I'll, I'll reimburse you for your for your time to do this and I think that's a fair thing to do and in that case I don't mind going through every single chart and looking at the inclusion exclusion criteria and seeing if the patient meets that but you know the majority of time I, I think they don't want to compensate us for that yeah. but um, you know I, I always ask for chart review fees and typically I get them it, it's rare that I don't get them they're getting so. more strict uh, yes, they're sir. actually first time ever they're asking for the writers to fill out surveys um, in addition to the feasibility, but they want each grader to fill out a survey now before you even select it. So that was the first for me uh, as well, and it was recently. Mm -hmm. It's just amazing how much, uh, how how much, how creative these. You know, I mean, it's it's just amazing. They're they're getting more creative with the questions, and and you just kind of wonder who's out there. You know, I mean, <laughs> uh, do they understand what, you know, what we have to do, what the process is on our end? I mean, you're right. I mean, we, we can't know for sure how many patients we're going to be able to, to recruit. I mean, obviously, we have to give them ball, you know, park figures, and I, and I understand that. I mean, it's part of their process. But um, I don't know. It's just really, really interesting out there. I think we ought to have a website just with quirky questions, you know. Um, and there are so many things that come involved with these protocols because even if you think that you have the right group of patients that fits the indication, you have no idea what their labs are going to be, what the EKG is going to be, these things you can't control. You have no idea and there's no way to look at that and says, well, this person's labs are going to be this way, so I've got that group and this group over here, their EKGs are going to be this way. You don't know those things. You don't, and you know, I think one of the things that we can do also when we're doing a feasibility survey um, is talk to the sponsor, and I've done this, and say, can you tell me for this indication, what was your screen fail rate? Give me an idea. And you know what? They'll share those numbers with you, which okay. is surprising to me, and I'm thankful for that. So, okay. yeah, I think that's idea. one thing we can do. It's a good idea. Excellent yeah. advice here. Uh, Anna, thank you. We can go on all day, but, um, you know, this is probably close to an hour so we'll have to do a part two sometime whenever you'd like and uh, my pleasure we're really thank you for having me yes thank oh, you for coming on and i mean it's been great i've learned a lot so i hope the audience can learn uh, a thing or two here and there yeah it's amazing how much we've covered i think it's just we've been all over the spectrum so um thank you so very much and i will chat with you whenever you want to dan 
And this is Dan and Don uh, signing off from the Clinical Trials Guru with Anna Marquez. Thanks a lot. Thank you.